Antonio Barbera is the founder and CEO of Table Tennis Connections, a 501c3 nonprofit organization that builds community and empowers neural development through table tennis, a.k.a. ping pong. Dr. Barbera has developed the NeuroPong system to forestall and even reverse the effects of neurodegenerative diseases such as multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, and cognitive impairment. And it's highly effective in supporting youth with attention deficit hyperactive disorder, a.k.a. ADHD. Yours truly. Uh, Dr. Barbera began his medical career in Italy, was a leading-edge gynecologist in Europe and the U.S. for over 30 years. He's invented new techniques, written numerous papers, and supported the delivery of more than 4,500 babies. He was forced into retirement by the effects of multiple sclerosis in 2017. In this episode, Antonio recounts a very dramatic and successful delivery, which was to be his last. His MS symptoms returned rapidly, which ultimately ended his career. A roller coaster of emotional and financial and physical challenges followed, along with the discovery of the beneficial effects of new neural growth, such as can occur through bilateral activities like table tennis. Today, Dr. Barbera is healthy and spry and took it easy on me in winning by a comfortable margin in our ping pong matches. This is a wonderful conversation with an amazingly interesting and thoughtful man early in the second chapter of his career as founder of a high-impact nonprofit, Table Tennis Connections. Let's have some fun. Welcome to the Loco Experience Podcast. On this show, you'll get to know business and community leaders from all around Northern Colorado and beyond. Our guests share their stories, business stories, life stories, stories of triumph and of tragedy, and through it all, you'll be inspired and entertained. These conversations are real and raw, and no topics are off limits. So pop in a breath mint and get ready to meet our latest guest. Welcome back to the Loco Experience Podcast. I'm honored today to be joined by Antonio Barbera. And Antonio is the founder of Table Tennis Connections here in Fort Collins, and that's a 501c3. And uh, I think it's best if I just let him share what he's up to. So can you just give us a good overview, and we'll get into the story of how this passion developed for you, but what is Table Tennis Connections doing right now in the region? Well, thank you for having me today this afternoon, and thank you also for your invitation. So Table Tennis Connections was born almost two years ago. Uh, from my deep desire of being able to provide some service to other people that surround me. Okay. The reason being that a few years ago I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, mm-hmm. and um, after two exacerbations, after two attacks, I was forced to leave my job that was uh, practicing medicine as a gynecologist here in Fort Collins. Mm. Uh, the most discomfort that I have from my multiple sclerosis is a sensation of chest compression that is with me 24 hours a day. Uh, people all over the world, and physicians and other people with these conditions, call that MS hug. Mm. It's a sensation of a hug, of a tightening. Mm. But uh, people experience that few minutes a day, here and there, in your belly, in your chest. For me, it's a 24 hours a day sensation. And sometimes it becomes really uncomfortable. It's really like as a constriction. And this is with you now? You've with this with me now, really, on the left side of my chest, right here in front. So throughout the day, it goes from left to right, right to left, front to back, um, changes constantly location, mm. and I feel that. It's there with me. It Always just keeps trunk, me though. always on my upper portion, yes, yeah. on my chest. And uh, just before COVID, uh, I was playing a little bit of ping pong in my garage. I know that you are a fanatic about this sport. <laughs> well, you beat me soundly in our first I game. I only beat you once. I'm looking forward to the rematch. <laughs> Very good. And uh, I started feeling a weird sensation in my body, and I had no idea what it was. So I kept playing for three or four more days, and at that point I realized that this sensation was leaving me alone. Well, the way I described this sensation, the hug was, the hug, it was gone. Well, the way I describe it is like this elephant is constantly sitting on my chest. And when I was playing, I was feeling this interesting sensation that this elephant was leaving me alone mm. and was just sitting on a chair right there in the corner. I said, wow, that's interesting. Yeah. So I said, well, can this activity be useful for other people with the same condition? 
And uh, I started searching and I started searching and I learned this fascinating uh, knowledge that was acquired in the medicine fields several years ago that is called neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. Mm. Means what? If your brain is stimulated enough, is challenged enough, it's able to produce new cells. Mm. That's the term neurogenesis. And if you continue to stimulate your brain, these chel- cells will differentiate in whatever your brain needs. Mm. So this is called neuroplasticity. Yeah, Creation yeah. of a new network of nerves, of impulse, of signals that will allow you to perform the specific activity that you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like if you run, your body kind of develops the muscles that you need to run. If you challenge your brain in that same kind of way, it will develop new cells to, to cover what you have given it to do as a task. Correct. The interesting thing is that your brain needs daily new tasks. Mm. So every time that we fall back in something that is the same, monotone, that is well known to our brain, well, our brain says, oh, I already know this. Yeah. I don't need to produce it's like driving anything. Somewhere. Yes, you don't even think. something that is you, you don't even think. So it's the constant stimulation, it's the constant challenge mm. that will stimulate your brain. So, like Sudoku. Or whatever, puzzles or games or things. Yeah, it, you know, crosswords, generally speaking, they go back on your old memories, mm. on your old, our, our yeah. wire, it's our words file. you've already yes. understood. You already understood. You memorize them somewhere. Mm-hmm. So your brain will work just on that portion of its function that is the memory, the mm-hmm. old memory, but nothing is stimulating it more. Right. So it, even with like math, pu- math puzzles like Sudoku or something, it's still just math. It's more like playing hide and seek with the math. Correct. That you already know. Correct. So nowadays people realize that there are a few things that stimulate your brain in a very positive way. A new instrument, mm. a new language, a social life, new friends, new physical activity. I don't know if I said the word already new, right? <laughs> I did. So that is the novelty that was acquired uh, almost, I think, 15 years ago. If you stimulate your brain with something new, your brain will stay active. Mm. Your brain is more alive than what we thought. Mm. Now, we generally use probably 9, 10% of our brain capabilities. So we need to stimulate our brain. Right. And that's what I try to do every day. Through table tennis connections. As well. As well. Oh, yes. just in general in as well. In general, yes, yeah. yes. And how about things like reading? And coming to learn new things and well, stuff like that. Reading That's... is good. Reading is good because uh, uh, you uh, learn more words. Your eyes, your vision is stimulated as well. Your processing is stimulated yeah, as well. Yeah, even your own thinking. Your own thinking. And so anything that stimulates you, your brain, is very important. Yeah. Just yeah. sitting on your couch with your remote control, it will just move one little finger. Yeah. And uh, you're most frying your brain unless you engage in a more active way. Well, I think we talked about that uh, we traded book recommendations, and mine was like the brain, I think it's David Engel or something like that. And like the big overarching theory was kind of garbage in, garbage out as well. Like if all you do is take in TV and stuff, or even worse, if you're watching porn or doing things that actively make your brain route new channels, but to garbage, like it's going to be harder for you to stay out of those ruts. Correct. Because now you get in those circuits, you get in this attitude, you get in those uh, behavior. Mm-hmm. Indeed. So um, so who, I guess, that you started, did you start right off the bat as a, as a nonprofit or have you recently gotten your nonprofit certifications? I mean... Uh, well, th- I became a nonprofit in July of 2021. Okay. And... Uh, but if you don't mind, I would like to tell our listeners a little bit more about I'm... what multiple sclerosis is. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, we are surrounded by many cables here in our studio. And uh, our cables are safe because uh, they have a protective layer of rubber and plastic that protects us mm-hmm. from any electrical shock. That is the way our nerves are built. Mm. So our nerves are protected by this sheet that is made by the specific substance that is called myelin Mm -hmm. that helps us to send the signal at the right speed in the right place. Without zapping all the muscles around it and stuff. In a very specific way. So it's protecting us to be very specific, very efficient 
in the terms of conduction of our stimulus to our yeah. muscle, for example. I think of it a lot like fiber optics almost. Like it's, it's just like this one the, little tube that goes through It's indeed there. like the, the, the major electrical panel in your garage. Hmm. So think about that. So here we are, and I'm moving my right arm, and you're moving your left leg. You're doing that because a part of your brain is saying that. Hmm. The camera was recording, wasn't it? As far as I know, I remember that. We should take a quick break. Why don't we do that? The Loco Experience is sponsored by InMotion, providing next-day delivery for local businesses. If you need anything delivered in northern Colorado, InMotion's flat fee service is a great resource for your business. Delivering from the Wyoming border to Denver and anywhere in between, their clients range from small breweries to real estate companies. InMotion can deliver almost anything you can imagine. If this fits a need for your business, contact InMotion directly by emailing them at InMotionNoCo at gmail.com. That's I-N-M-O-T-I-O-N-N-O-C-O at gmail.com. And mention you heard it on the Loco Experience. So, so these, these tubes... Well, these electrical wires, they bring a signal to our anything that we do in our body. Yeah. The way we move, the way we think, the way we engage with each other, every single thing happens because there is an electrical signal that goes somewhere, coming from somewhere else, and this electrical signal needs to move at a specific speed and being protected mm -hmm. and selective. And this is happens thanks to this protection that each nerve has of this sheet made by this specific substance. It's called myelin. Now, in people like me, this myelin is destroyed. So there are portions... It's like a protein that gets attacked somehow or well, something? Well, it's a layer, it's a fat layer that is attacked by ourselves. Mm. So it's considered to happen because we place in act this distraction, physical distraction, biological distraction of this layer, and our white blood cells do that. Mm -hmm. Now, we do not know why our blood cells do yeah, that, yeah. but that's what happens. So it's, an, it's an autoimmune disease, It's an ultimately. autoimmune. It, the, the, the mechanism is an autoimmune. Right. Now, who but, stimulates that? We have absolutely no idea. Fair. So... Uh, there are people like me that were able to recover uh, from the attack and people that uh, are not able to. Yeah. And so, frankly, I don't know why I am so lucky compared to many other people. I was able to recover my right leg that was lost for two months. Mm. And uh, I was also able to recover my left arm that was gone for nine months. Nobody, of course, was able to tell me, okay, Antonio, you, you're going to be able to recover There's that. There's no PT or anything. There was nothing, really. I was doing PT. I was doing hand therapy uh, and as well, uh, and treatment. But um, I was always looking at this limb of mine like something that didn't belong to me. I had no sensation, so, yeah. no motion control, nothing. So what was that like? It like just hung there kind of? It was like the cup sitting on our desk right now. Oh, wow was not mine. He was moving whenever he wanted. <laughs> I wasn't feeling anything. I was bumping everywhere. I was having cuts here and there. No cold, no hot sensation, nothing. Wow. So I was putting this, when I was driving, I was putting this under my leg mm. to avoid any weird movement. And uh, I had all my clothes with, without any tie, without any belt, without any lace in my shoes. I was putting this hand in one on my pocket. Yeah. Otherwise, it would move anarchically, and it was offensive sometimes. Could you do things like button your shirt? No, stuff? no, no, I couldn't do anything. Really? Yeah. It was interesting. I remember one day I was uh, at, the, at the restaurant in the morning at lunchtime, and there was a short, very small corridor. I was waiting for my food, and there was a lady passing by, and my hand just moved and touched her. <laughs> and I felt so embarrassed. I, I looked at her with a really asking for an apology, uh, asking for an apology, but... I didn't forgiveness. say anything. I didn't have the yeah. courage to say, I'm sorry. I, I just was so ready in my face. I, I couldn't control this thing. <laughs> it was interesting. <laughs> that sounds like an excuse. Oh, uh, well, no. <laughs> no, I, you're a married guy. <laughs> so, so that's the, and I've heard that in Colorado here that, that there's more MS than there is in a lot of places. And there's theories about it being related to sunlight or elevation or air quality. There are many theories about that. There is definitely a, uh, one of the highest population of people living with MS in Colorado compared to other states. And uh, uh, and people say, okay, the farthest you are from the equator, the higher the incidence of multiple sclerosis. Uh, but there's really nothing scientifically proven about mm. that. Okay. 
But we do have one of the highest incidents. So, circa me, when is this that you were going through, you know, the loss of your leg function and arm? So, it was five years ago. I was 55. The first attack was in 2016. Okay. I was just having people over my house, and I started feeling something weird on my leg. Like if somebody was pouring boiling oil on my hip. Oh, my. Oh, my. Yes. And so, it was a night when I had some <laughs> Italian friends over, and we were playing uh, Italian uh, songs and singing. At a certain point, I told my partner, Gail, I'm sorry, I need to stay away because I'm having pain. And she said, what are you talking about? Yes, I'm having this pain on my hip. Hmm. And uh, a physical therapist friend of mine was uh, there with us. And she told me, okay, Antonio, let me see what I can do. And But I said, listen, nothing is happening. I mean, really, I can move. My mobility is there. Is this pouring boil that is coming, uh, uh, oil that is coming from my hip down to my leg? <laughs> So I tried to take a hot shower, cold shower, nothing worked until finally, after almost two hours, this oil just went away from my, the tip of my toes. Hmm. Wow. And I said, what's going on? Uh, I don't know. And so two days later, I woke up abruptly because the same oil was now on my right knee. Hmm. It woke me up and I started screaming and crying from the pain. Hmm. It happened again the following day. And at that point, I spoke with the neurosurgeon, and they decided, okay, why don't we do some imaging of, of your lower back? Well, th nothing was there. And since nothing was there, we put attention to the central brain, to whatever you call the central nervous system. And uh, my brain was like a Christmas tree. So if we do an imaging of your brain, and my, or yours, uh, there's a gray and white color. Now, on top of the gray, imagine if we put so many other sparkling area, very bright and white. Okay. They are lighting up. Those are called plaques. And those are the areas where these lesions mm. are. are kind of letting the electricity out of the sheath? No, 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 it's because it's an inflammation appearance. Mm. And so they look white with a gray background, and you can spot them right away. Yeah. And they generally located in the brain, in the optical nerve, in the cervical and thoracic portion. And they found this on you. And they you found this thick, on my brain. You're thick with it. Right there on my brain. And uh, if after three days, uh, my right leg was completely gone. Full paralysis. Mm. Zero. I have no so control of this leg. Or uh, crutches. You can yes, crutches wheelchair. Kinda. And I was limping uh, for a week until finally I had no control anymore. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and what does these did these lesions mean something to the doctors that were scanning uh, you? Well, such, the or? lesions, the size and the location of the lesions sometimes may have a correspondence with the clinical symptoms that you may have. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you have clinical, uh, sorry, if you have lesions in your neck, most likely that's what happened. For example, when I lost my left arm, I had new lesions in my uh, mm. the portion in the cervical portion of my spine, um, but. Again, you may have many lesions, but they may not be active. Mm. Or you, they look like scar in your brain. Mm. Of course, the more lesion you have, the more attack you have, uh, the less capability your body has to reproduce yeah. the myelin sheet that we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. And so the more inflammation mm. episodes you have, the less your body is able to wake up, get rid of that inflammation, and reproduce again the myelin. And so in your case... You've had two major uh, inflammation episodes, but been able to limit it at that, which is why you can beat me in ping pong. Correct. Whatever. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yes. So I was lucky enough. I mean, again, I was pushing myself in the attempt to recover. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and I was doing three times physical therapy, two times a week uh, in therapy. Uh, of course, in the meantime, I lost my job. I couldn't do perform any surgery. I mean, I was confused as well. My, multiple sclerosis, besides expressing itself with something that you may see, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, if you look at me, Antonio, you look normal if you allow me this word. Yeah. Uh, but it's called the invisible condition. Yeah. So if I don't take a specific medication, I am unable to maintain my attention throughout the day. Hmm. So I'm able to stay here with you at this time in the afternoon because I take a medication in the morning. And it took me a while to realize, oh my gosh, I'm passing out at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Hmm. I need to sleep. I need to rest. Things were overwhelming me. Hmm. Uh, I was looking at this key holder and said, oh my gosh, what does he want from me? Really, silly things were becoming overwhelming. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, I was losing attention, the focus. I was foggy. Yeah. 
actually the fatigue is the uh, um, the symptoms that the majority of people experience. Besides the physical fatigue, the mentally intellectual fatigue. Hmm. They are overwhelmed. Yeah. Little things are too much. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Yes. So. I guess, how does that play out? Like, that was first in 2017. First was in 2016. 16, sorry. The, yeah, the leg came back after two or three months, and I continued to work. I was very happy. I had a cane for a while, and uh, um, at that time, I was thinking, oh, my gosh, the first time I go back to Europe, I'm going to start collecting this amazing cane from 1700, 1800, since I, probably I should continue to use a cane. But guess what? I was lucky enough to drop the cane. Yeah. So forget yeah. about my collection of canes. But 11 months and a few days into the condition, I had another attack. This is your left arm, then. My left arm. So there was a beautiful day that started very beautifully. I was on call. And uh, uh, I had a beautiful delivery uh, uh, just before the shift of the anesthesiologist went ending on Saturday morning. And uh, I had a delivery of twin uh, babies. Uh, I don't know if we said that. Yeah, I was a yeah. gynecologist. Yeah, and yeah. I I actually was thinking proctologist at first, but gynecologist, no, no, I switched, you delivered babies. I switched. Yeah, I switched from proctology <laughs> to gynecology. How many babies have you delivered? You know, that's a question that many people ask me often. I am in the high 4,000. So around 47, 4,800. Gotcha. Felt just short of the 5,000 Yes, short of the 5,000, yes. Well. And uh, so I was on call again, and uh, uh, we, everybody was waiting for these two babies to arrive. Well, this pregnancy was very unique. And this lady, the, the second baby, I mean, the baby that was farther up in mom's belly, was breech, means mm. was his yeah. feet Backwards. were first. Yes. Yeah. And a uh, few people here in Colorado like to do breech extraction of twin babies. So this lady came from the uh, front range, and I told her, well, I consulted with her, and I told her, well, I will do all my best to deliver your baby vaginally. And so we delivered the first baby, and now I need to take care of the second baby. So I locked myself within my mind. I closed my eyes, and I was feeling the feet of this baby. I grabbed the feet of this baby. I asked the nurse to help me to keep mom steady and stable. And I was able to do this beautiful, what we call this a spin move. Well, yeah, we did a breech extraction. Oh. So I pulled the baby down. I had to rotate his shoulder. I just was looking inside the pelvis and just visualizing the maneuver I was supposed to do. And it was just beautiful. Nailed it. And everybody in the room was so happy. Mom was happy. The nurse was happy. That was a big success for the entire team. Yeah. We spent the entire night with this lady. So you can imagine I was so happy. I went home. I was walking on a cloud. I was really feeling so happy. And uh, it was Saturday afternoon. And uh, Saturday at noon, the senior center was having ping pong. Mm. So at noon, I go to play ping pong. And the first time that the ball goes on the ground and I go to pick it up, I realized that my left hand was not grabbing the ball. I was mm. landing three inches from the ball. Mm. So whoa, what's going on? So I was finally able to... But you didn't have that boiling pain or anything like that nothing, yet? Nothing, nothing. So uh, I finally picked it up, and I tossed the ball in the air. I served. The ball went down on the ground again. And the second time, I couldn't pick up the ball with my left hand. So I, I couldn't reach the ball. I was looking at the ball. My left hand was unable to reach the ball. The ball. Remember, we were talking about yeah. the control of each of our movements through these electrical wires, through our nerves. So I pick up the ball with my right hand. I put it on my chest. I grab it now with my left hand. I toss the ball. And my left hand goes somewhere. The ball goes somewhere else. And it was 12.08. So I was eight minutes in my ping pong Saturday morning. And I say, okay, I'm going home. Yeah. Now, I was on call that day. All right. And so what I started seeing, my left hand was moving anarchically. My middle two fingers were just moving, yeah. flexing by themselves. I say, oh my gosh, what's going on? I, I didn't want to say to myself, okay, is this another attack? But I was fearing that. Did you, did you suspect or believe oh, in yeah. SL already by then? Like I, that was the suspected diagnosis or was this... No, no, I had, I had a clear diagnosis. Okay, by you then. did. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And, and I said, no, it cannot be possible. Dang, King, dang who knows? So... Uh, I went home and I was pretty sad. Uh, and at three o'clock in the afternoon, the ER called me. I said, Antonio, we may have a case for you. Hmm. Surgical case. I said, wow. So I was looking at my hand. Okay, I can do this. I can still move. I can control it. If they call me, I can still do that. Uh, 
so I tried to f- reach my partner. She was skiing. Mm. And I told her, listen, I don't know what's going to happen with me because I don't know what's happening with my left hand. How far away are you? Oh, I'm four hours away. So, ooh, okay. So finally at five, I remember those times very vividly. At five, the ER called me and said, Antonio, you're free. There's nothing that belongs to you. We are sending the lady home. I said, wow. Whew, thankfully. But 6.40 p.m., my hand was gone. My hand completely disappeared hmm. in front of me. Boom. Still no pain. Just poof. Done. And so uh, in the meantime, uh, my partner came back in town, and I said, please take over my call. And that was the last of my s- hmm. day as a physician. I'm sorry. It was exactly all. Thank well, you. you. You went out on top. You had the, the breech twist. My guy. Kind of I, 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 you know, I <laughs> kept telling myself in the first year, at least I finished with the, this beautiful, beautiful procedure. Yeah. Maneuver. It was just yeah. beautiful experience. Yeah. And that was it. And so what a, what a trauma, um, ultimately. Yes. Um, no notice, obviously. And somebody had to cover your next long call and your next regular shift and all that. Of course. I had to change... My life entirely. I mean, I had to change medication. Um, uh, it was intense. Did you have support? Like, did you have disability insurance coverage? Uh, or did you have I was leave? On, I, I, you, I, yeah. I was on a short leave. Uh, it's called short-term disability for a while, for one or two months. But my hospital kept calling me. So when are you coming back? I said, guys, my hand is not with, <laughs> my hand is not with me. It's not funny. And, uh, and I told them, I said, guys, the moment I will be ready to come, I guarantee you I will come back. And they kept telling me, well, we need to test you. Say, guys, if I'm coming, you can do any test you want. means I am comfortable and I can do whatever I want. Uh, But, you know, the short-term disability, the moment is five months and 29 days and 23 hours and 59 minutes is over. Yeah. And so mm, I ultimately stopped working. Yeah. Have you... um really worked since then? No, no, absolutely not. Not, not as no, a doctor, not as no, really anything to no, speak of. No. On your new passion, really. Only on that. So yes. you had like, that was a, a year or that a year and a half, I guess? was in 2017, Well, yes. and plus you had like eight, nine more months of oh, not to recover your thing. arm yes, working. Yes. So it was March 2017, and I don't recall if by Christmas or January of next year, I start finally feeling something mm. in, my, in my left mm-hmm. hand. Okay. Yep. Um, well... Let's let's talk more about like what this table tennis connections like how how that idea morphed into what you should do with it a little bit. So I use my own experience, and uh, I said, well, if I have some benefits, can I present this to other people with multiple sclerosis? Yeah. And I start searching for that, and I found few information about the benefits of mm, table tennis. You can call ping pong as well if you want, but table tennis is better. Uh, with people with Parkinson and dementia. Oh, not so much with MS, but with... Not so much with MS, yeah. and also with uh, people with attention deficit disorder. Yeah, like yours truly. Here we go. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but the point was, uh, you no, know, I am a physician, and I have over 140 scientific publications. So for me, it was, okay, what can I do? You are published? Oh, yeah. I'm, oh, wow. I'm, I'm, so you were an OG, uh, not just a regular baby doctor, but you were no, kind I of wasn't, the, the, I, I the leading was, edge. Well, I was for a while a pupil of the Italian Society of Studies and Gynecology. I invented certain things in my field oh. as well. And uh, well, we'll come back and we'll hear some of those things. Yeah, yeah, we'll come back at that. So I said, okay, what can I do? So I found few papers, actually one from the Karolinska Institute. Uh, there were only nine people with Parkinson, and they did a little bit of ping pong with them. Right. So, wow. So I a said, real well, expansive study there. <laughs> so I said, well, you know what? I'm going to try to do something for other people. Yeah. Now, you know, it took me more than one and a half year to recover emotionally from this diagnosis. Yeah, from, I was going to say, diagnosis. it yeah. wasn't just a uh, physical And recovery. I had to do something with my life. Yeah. And so I said, well, I can do something. So I um, um, decided to fund this, to have this uh, nonprofit. And uh, it took me a while to decide the name. Table tennis connections. Now, connections are what is right now between my headphone sure. and the plug. Connections are between my right and left brain, between you and me. 
between me and my limbs that came back, connections between me and the eight year old Sophie that beat me in my first tournament, uh, connection between me and my oldest player that is 93. Sure. Um, connection between different players of different nations, of different skin color, of different accent. And so it's a human connection. Yeah. So table tennis connections. And, um, and so it was interesting because, you know, it took me forever to find a roof in town. I begged anybody in town to give me a gym, weird hours, a weird location, a rental location. Of course, I couldn't afford any rental location. Uh, and I knocked everywhere. Yeah. And eventually, uh, the Boys and Girls Club of Larimer County offered me a roof, and I'm so grateful to them. And uh, that is where our club uh, portion of the kind organization of the headquarters is. headquarters now. Headquarters, yes. For now. For now. Uh, and then you also do almost like a, a traveling Well, what happened, <laughs> what happened was this. I mean, I had to recruit people to offer uh, uh, this possibility to people with multiple sclerosis, Parkinson, and uh, Alzheimer. And, but these people told me, well, Antonio, those hours are too late for us because we rent right. in the evening. And so I had to rent a gym in a church on the south portion of town. And uh, thanks to that as well, we um, have a very big number of people with Parkinson. Uh, and uh, we are now offering the, a, a, a class also to people with multiple sclerosis. And we were joined two weeks ago by at least 11 people with mild cognitive impairment. Hmm. Very, very Like nice. early stage dementia. Early stage almost. of dementia. They may go into dementia or not. Um, so... As I was telling you earlier on, for me, the major goal is to bring science behind the benefits of this sport. Yeah. So, and so what, what, have you, what have you discovered in the, on that? Well, yeah. I created this specific ping pong program that is called Neuropong. Okay. Um, and I offer the first initial 12 weeks, and I present uh, with specific exercise, with specific management of the ping pong ball, the paddles, a specific technique a specific approach to the game that is based on your own brain. So if I have a person in front of me with multiple sclerosis, I need to assess and see what the condition is yeah. in that specific person. The sure. same thing, what the Parkinson condition is affecting that specific and body. It's not just compared. about levels. It's, it's also not just about, about the condition. What parts of the body are Correct. They tremors, it's, is they whatever. It's just about you yeah. because... Each of us, even if we have the same condition, experience that in a completely different way. Totally. Yeah. So no two people are alike, and especially we have, you may have the same lesion in your brain, and they express themselves in a completely different way. Yeah. And there Mine are people, just makes me dance funny. I see you dancing right I now. I do dance funny. I do, yeah. You do dance very funny. We need to check <laughs> your nerves. my wife. You need to check your nerves. I will do something with I've that. I've been watching Seinfeld lately. <laughs> Here we Lane's, go. Uh, crazy dance. Here we go. Um, so... You know, we probably don't have enough data really to like throw it down, but what can you tell me about what you've seen so far? Because you've helped dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of Well, I am right now I have a so pool far. of 70 people. So what's okay. happening is I'm finishing, I have the last four weeks of study, this pilot study in mm. the people that experiencing Parkinson. Okay. And in doing that, I associate myself with a movement disorder center at Anschutz Medical Center. Mm. Mm -hmm. So I decided at the beginning... I was a gynecologist. Now I'm learning everything about neurology, and I love that. I'm reading as much as I can, yeah. but they need experts sure. around me. So I uh, create, a, a, establish a, a relationship with the movement disorder centers for the Parkinson. Mm. I establish a relationship with a, a, multiple, a Rocky Mountain Multiple Sclerosis Center. Great. And I establish another relationship with two amazing scientists that work on Alzheimer. Mm. So we are finishing the first study on Parkinson. We have the last four weeks, and we're going to go over the data. And we are starting pretty soon the two studies on people experiencing multiple sclerosis and uh, mild dementia. You should look into uh, an organization just won a Better Business Bureau Torch Award that works with the dementia community. Oh. And it's all about relationship and having kind of hope and positivity within the relationship. And uh, they're a, a really a relatively young nonprofit as well, but that's already making a ton of impact. So it could be a great strategic partnership. Very nice. I, I will take this as an enrichment for me. As a matter of fact, I mean, I've been uh, uh, communicating and working a little bit with another big organization called Dementia Together. Yeah, that's them. 
that was founded by this amazing lady in Windsor. Yeah, that's and her. now we are creating. <laughs> we are You're creating. Yes, one step ahead of me. and uh, we are creating this uh, um, collaboration awesome. officially. And so people, uh, this lady was really. It's so amazing because really her major goal is to educate people about this condition. And she is on the spot. She say we need to listen to people with the condition. Yeah. So for me, the goal is not just to make sure that your ping pong stroke is better than mine. Well, yours will never be better than mine. Let's <laughs> no, say that. obviously. But uh, uh, not even that you're going to become a champion, but that you have a benefit, a neurological benefit. Yeah. I also care about your relationship with your partner. Are you sleeping better? Are you eating better? So for me, is how are you doing? Mm. It's not just how your tremor is doing. Sure. Uh, and uh, the social impact of this sport is amazing. Mm. Now, you were asking me earlier on about data. Well, I'm producing them. But anecdotally, just looking at these people, yeah. these people were unable to bounce the ball in their hand more than twice. Now you should see what they do. The ball <laughs> never goes on the ground. Never. At the beginning, we had all these underballs tum, 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 all over the place. Now you barely hear sound. Yeah. So they can toss the ball, they can touch the ball with the paddle, they can move, they have a better balance. And guess what? They smile. Mm. And uh, that for me is <laughs> the yeah. most important payoff. I mean, I see they're happy. Uh, we sweat for two hours. Uh, they go home and guess what? They come back again. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. So what's your vision for this? Like, is this... Something that you want to build, like sustainable mass here locally, and then take it to other places, or does getting sustainable mean being in lots of different geographic places because it's programmatic more than it is, you know, all flowing through Antonio's fingertips? Uh, Antonio should is just the <coughs> the beginner. Antonio, hopefully, I want to create a, a, a legacy. I want to leave a legacy, so. I work in Fort Collins. Uh, uh, here in Fort Collins, we have two locations. I've been driving to Boulder for one year now, three times a week. And last month, we finally acquired a new location. Oh, good. And now we are starting again with people in, Bo in Boulder. Uh, I'm finishing some agreement in Denver. Uh, I am uh, flying next week to Tucson, where I am in touch with one support group for people with Parkinson, one support group with people with multiple sclerosis, and uh, a, a group of neurologists. Mm. In, at the beginning of June, I'm going to Utah, where uh, uh, we are starting a program as well there. Uh, I am in touch with a lady in Oregon, in Portland, that is actually finishing a study right now on mm. physical activity in people with multiple sclerosis. Mm. So what I, my goal and my dream is to have this Neuropong program yeah. in many places as possible in the entire world. Well, in doing this, of course, I cannot do it alone, nor I want to. I have established another relationship with the International Table Tennis Federation Foundation. Oh. And so, um, thanks to them, uh, I'm, I'm working on a book called the New Ropong Handbook. Oh, sweet. Where I can share my experience with other people. And so, we want to make sure that everybody in the world, in the most remote place, yeah. can have access to this If you read this, this book, you can do a lot of this stuff. They are going to publish right, this book yeah. on their website. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go all over the place to uh, teach about this New Ropong. Uh, my next trip is going to be in Italy. Uh, where I'm working with a, a, an institution that takes care of people with Parkinson and uh, multiple sclerosis close to Milan. Mm. And, of course, I got in touch with a ping pong club there as well. They are getting certified in Europong. Uh, there is a group in Sicily, where I'm originally from, that is organizing another event in September. Wow. And they invite me for this Europong as well. So it's this Europong project. Yeah. That's the way I call well, and to make this a business podcast more than human interest, how do you how do you monetize it? Like, can you license the Neuropong to all these different folks that deliver it? Is there, you know, will you have to continue to develop trainings, things? How do you, yeah. From my personal point of view, I, what I will do is train them in this. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a certification where you are certified in the Neuropong. To deliver Neuropong. To deliver Neuropong. Now, uh, that uh, <laughs> puts together a, a theoretical knowledge about brain, theoretical knowledge about how we work, how our brain works, and uh, theoretical knowledge about a specific exercise in ping pong. Yeah. Now, I don't care if you are an amazing ping pong player, if you have no idea how your brain is working, then, and if you are unable to communicate with a person. Yeah. 
I don't care if you are this amazing scientist if you cannot put the ball on the other side of the net on a ping pong table. <laughs> so I like to create this eclectic figure that has some knowledge on ping pong and that has enough knowledge about these conditions and they need to continue to maintain their certification. Now, uh, where do we find the money for all this? Well, so far, uh, they just well, You're came creating out. a lot of value. I am creating um, value. But, you know, monetizing We need to monetize it. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, so far, we have been able to survive, and let me use the word survive, uh, with some funds uh, given by some private friends, some friends and some uh, um, private foundation. Um, the amount has never been enough, so we are always struggling uh, financially. And that is why, for example, uh, our class are, guess what? Five dollars for two hours of class. <laughs> and uh, I uh, that room on the upside on that. <laughs> yes. And th th just I asked them, say, would you please help me to pay the rent? Yeah. So these at certain points should become a su very sufficient business. It doesn't matter if indeed my goal is to have a social approach or a scientific approach, but Nothing happens without money in life. Yeah, no, it's true. And, Impossible. You know, I, I, I use that, uh, you know, easy to add a lot of value, sometimes hard to get it back out. But $5 is is very little, you it's, know. It's uh, it, You know, how much a, a, a care facility probably costs $10,000 a month. Absolutely. Or something. And, you know, people were telling me, Antonio, you're putting so much effort, physical and emotional, with only one person. Well, you know what? That person in this moment needs more attention. I'm sorry. Uh, I yeah. don't go. I don't see the clock. But uh, you are absolutely right. Yeah, I, I yeah. am really uh, constantly in search of funds. So I apply for grants, uh, and I ask friends, and I. Well, I think your funds are right there. Like if somebody's dropping off their parent for a two-hour class of ping pong, that they're going from not being able to bounce a ball or throw it up and catch it to being almost no balls hitting the floor. I mean, plumbers are a hundred dollars an hour more. $150 an hour, right? And so at the at the very least, it seems to me that it could be a $50 session per person. And now in a, if you'd have 10, 10 guests, so you got even tables, you know, five tables, 10 guests, whatever. So that's 50 times 10 is $500. Well, now you can, with $200, you can hire somebody to help you. Absolutely. <laughs> and then there's margin to, Absolutely. you know, create I, stuff. You know, the organizational cost is... Believe it or not, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I drove for one year, three times a week to Boulder right. during COVID. At least you need to cover your gas money. And the, no, <laughs> and the gas was, what, almost $5 a gallon. Sure. And uh, nothing happened. Of course, the class at the senior center were free. I never asked for money. But uh, and actually, I just met a, a gentleman with Parkinson in Boulder say, Antonio, you cannot continue like this. Right. So I say, I am uncomfortable to ask for money. I say, well, let me do that for you. So I'm finally trying to find some help in people that recognize the value. Yeah. I mean, if you really go to, uh, I don't know, in any coffee shop and you buy a little bit of coffee with 2% milk and nothing else in a small cup, it's right there at $6. <laughs> right. Uh, don't even think of asking for a scone because the scone itself now is four point something dollars. And uh, if you go to a more famous coffee shop, I mean, they even put some puffs of, I don't know what, oxygen that is already there in the air. <laughs> and so $9. it's 7 and $9. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, so, indeed. You're right. Um, well, I guess one way I would like to encourage is that if you charge a, a market-appropriate price to enough people, then you can give it away to people that really need it and just can't pay for it. Absolutely. So uh, in this task, uh, I'm still looking for... Big donors, some big means people that grasp the idea, grasp the concept, yeah. and see the beauty of this, that they have some possibility of helping me. Uh, and actually, uh, thanks to one uh, person you put me in touch with, I have another meeting next week, okay. and let's see what this person will tell me. Uh, I am really in, in, looking for this location where my tables can be there. Yeah. So these they don't are have to be, always be set up, oh my but gosh. they can be stored I mean, there, so you don't have to be trucking things around correct, the trailer. Correct, correct. It's very painful and it's time consuming and I get five dollars per So hour. to get precise on that, like if you had a location ideally in northern Colorado in Fort Collins, you know, close to where a lot of older people live or have easy access to and a building that isn't used all the time. There are many places here in Fort Collins. Yeah. They are they are empty. Uh, gyms or private places or ex club or lounges bar or something like that. I mean 
I will try to maintain them. Yeah. Uh, if you guys give me a roof. <laughs> it's really, uh, and a roof is not just on a time. Well, I mean, and the thing is, you could have, you could have five locations around Northern Colorado easy if you easy. had a place to store the tables easy. and stuff and easy. different communities could develop their own easy. kind of guests and stuff easy. like that. Having a roof that is not on a time machine, I mean, people tell me, okay, you need to be out by three. I should introduce you to the Matthews House. Um, have you connected with them at all yet? No, not yet. They've got a great facility over at the Genesis Project Church Building and some extra spaces and stuff. It could be that they would find a good partnership. And they have they really serve the the, the underprivileged community. Um, there's a big trailer park near them and homework helpers for kids and stuff. But I'm sure there's ADHD and things like that. I cannot ask thick. for any better relationship. Yeah. Yes, again... The, we really want to be very inclusive and very diverse at the yeah. same time. It's not just about the MS and the Parkinson's. No, it's about, and the, the I always say, are you it's a human good being? good for everybody. <laughs> I'm going to ask you the same question to you since you were talking about sci-fi. Are you a human being? Maybe. P- pretty sure. Please. Either that okay, or, a, okay. a, or some or kind something. of a computer stimulation, now, right? You have a brain, apparently. It's a little bit. Okay, so even a little bit. Do you want to have fun? I do. Okay, so ping pong is good for you. <laughs> Perfect. Now, it's not going to be the panacea for every single thing, but... Let me give you a little bit of science. Uh, one in nine of us will get dementia. Okay, mm. We have no idea who. Wow. Now, uh, since we don't know what dementia is, uh, we have no treatment. And the medication are out on the market really don't do anything good. Yeah. So scientifically, it has been pro- proven that two things are good for people with Alzheimer's, also mild cognitive impairment. Mm-hmm. They are physical activity mm-hmm. and social life. Oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> think about this 2.5 grams of ping pong ball and uh, a bunch of people that enjoy doing the same thing. Here yeah. you have already the recipe, perfect, physical activity and social life. Plus, this ping pong puts together aerobic activity, anaerobic activity, balance, <laughs> eye stimulation, eye and coordination. I think I remember you asking Oma if she had any oxygen for me when we were playing ping pong earlier. Did, you were chasing yes. me all I around s- I the saw room. You, I saw you panting. <laughs> By the way, uh, I just brought you today <coughs> three decent ping pong balls. Okay? I was playing with you with this one star ball that were ridiculous, but now you can tell everybody, now I have Nice balls to play ping pong. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so You're much. More than and for the t shirt, too. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Um, so, so, I guess that's where you're heading is to try to really develop this ultimately uh, a set of contractors that'll want to like be and stay certified, and you can kind of release new things and exercises almost like start, a Peloton or correct. something. Correct. I right? will start the educational Neuropon. process. I will start the educational process. Um, I can be helped also by uh, other table tennis club all over the sure. nation. Sure, yeah. And anybody uh, at that club could anybody, be certified yes, how to deliver they the want. product. Really, I need the person behind your skills. Yeah. It doesn't matter to me if you're an amazing player. It really doesn't. Yeah. I need to feel you as a human being that wants to put your time in these conditions and help people. Yeah. That is the first step. It's a little bit like our local facilitators. Absolutely, you yes. You know, they're they're not there for the money. We do pay them for their time, and, and I'm sure your folks should be able to earn something for their time. They could. Right? But then also it's more about, you know, do you have a heart for this community? Correct. You know, did you lose your dad to Alzheimer's? Does your mom suffer from Parkinson's right now? And this has made a difference. This book did. You know, the more I talk to people about that, and again, my first goal is to increase the awareness about these things, the more I find people that have some relative, yeah, mom, sister, brother, grandpa, with one of these conditions. Yeah. And that is the first goal. So let me tell you something else. I mean, in October, I will go to this event that is uh, two weeks of Olympic sports in St. George, Utah. Okay. It's called the Senior Huntsman, World Senior Huntsman Game. Okay. Collects people coming from more than 50 nations in the world. Okay. Two weeks of Olympic of any kind of sports. Well, guess what? One of the sports is table tennis. So I went there the first year, and uh, uh, now you're going to laugh at me. Uh, I was nobody. I still am. And I won a gold medal out of the blue. What? Well, really? What? That's what I said. I didn't know that. <laughs> That's what I said. But um, I had some, uh, mm, not an argument, I had some discussion. This is when? 
2000 to that now is 2021. No doubt. Yes. Oh, I didn't. Re- well, I should feel better about my. You, you didn't beat should. me by as much as you. Well, could have. because we are using your rules. These <laughs> rules that were abandoned like, I don't know, 20 years ago to right to 21. Let's use these different rules we'll, next time. I'll let we'll you do teach that. You. <laughs> and so the point was that um, I had some uh, discussion with the uh, director of the table tennis event. And. Um, and we really arrived at peace. We clarify every single thing. But there was a good trigger to keep us in touch. Yeah. And a few months later, this event happens always in October. I told her, say, what do you think if I organize something for you next year? Say, what are you talking about? Well, you didn't know that I have MS. And I guarantee you, in 200 people playing table tennis there, somebody has Parkinson's, somebody has mild dementia. Yeah. I mean, it's, it might not be evident yet. but No, my gosh. We are. We just say that one in, one, in nine, one in one right. in nine will get mild dementia, right? We were two hundred and twenty-five, and so um, I told her, "So why don't we do something?" Well, we go very slow. Uh, the organization doesn't move fast. So why don't I start working on something? So I started working on email and proposal, and after five months of emails back and forth, they allowed me mm. to present this Neuropong event. Oh, cool! Was on me. Because they didn't want to be involved much, but it was very successful. Well, they gave you a venue. They did. And they gave me the first four <laughs> tables right there at yeah. the entrance of this. We had more than 30 tables set. Oh, wow. set. Uh-huh. And so actually at the beginning of the event, uh, uh, the, uh, the co-director said everything about the Neuropong. And so everybody started to be curious. And we had this colorful shirt with a brain on, on it. And so everybody came close to the table to see our tournament. Mm-hmm. The most important four tables right there at the entrance. And the event was amazing. So as a matter of fact, I mean, as a result of that, that is why I'm creating a Neuropong program in Utah now. Mm-hmm. And in October, we are going to have another oh, event right there. It's like a, a coalition of the willing. Like Indeed. people through that said, I want to be part of bringing Indeed. this to my community, my town, my state. And in the meantime, I... They called me at a certain point. Antonio, there is a lady that doesn't move. Would you please come over? Well, this lady was having one of those freezing moments mm. that happened to people living with Parkinson. Mm. And of course, nobody knew about that. Mm. And uh, three or four other people said, my, well, my husband has mild cognitive impairment. Here he is. He just played. And so we stay in touch. And we are creating a community. So my goal was, okay, guys, I want to shine a light on these people, not because they are different. We are not at the zoo with, with these weird animals. <laughs> they are us and we are yeah, them. Yeah. So we are part of the society. Society needs to know because things happen to everybody. Yeah. So let's put down any taboo, any stigma about these conditions and talk about this. Yeah, yeah. And that is indeed what, for example, Dementia Together is doing about dementia. Yeah. Uh, we need to make people aware. I met her uh, when she was brand new, I think six months in, and had a chance to talk to some group I was at, a chamber meeting or something. And I was like, wow, this lady's going to make a difference. You know, you, I was a banker for a long time. I could Amazing. just kind of tell. And I, and I could tell the same about you. You're, you're not even two years old as a nonprofit. And having all these travels, all these connections, all these national organizations. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I'm sure sometimes you're feeling like, when is it going to get easier? And it, but it will. You're doing the right things. Uh, I hope so soon. Uh, you know, um, at the beginning, I was not discouraged. But, but I wonder, I said, what am I doing? Nobody's giving me anything. Yeah. Uh, should I persist in that? And I said, well, I will. It was important for me. So the moment I start sharing the value and people start telling, oh my gosh, Antonio, it's yeah. very, very nice and important. Yeah. So, okay, you guys support me morally? Well, you've built a seat of interest now and now it's time, frankly, to charge for the value you're yeah, delivering. To, we need to take a different direction, yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, I feel like you've got a thousand interesting stories uh, from your lifetime and your 150 papers published and whatever else. Um, is it time to like hear a little bit more about Antonio and where in Sicily and things like that? Well, yes, absolutely. So <laughs> I was born actually in Calabria. It's the last region of Italy before your ride to Sicily. Okay. But my parents were originally from Sicily. So at the age of 10, we moved back to the motherland. I see. And so I grew up there. My mostly... And describe Sicily. Is it like a, it's, I know it's an island, but it's almost like, it's almost semi-independent from Italy, right? Uh... Sicily, if you think of a paradise on earth, okay. that is Sicily. Huh. Means there was the center of the, Med- the still is the center of the Mediterranean. Mm. And now we had invasions from anywhere. Right. So this north 
and southeast portion of Sicily was part of the Magna Grecia. So we were really Greek. Mm. And the west portion was completely associated with Africa. Oh, wow. So you have different attitude, different skin color, different spices, different food. Geography of this island is amazing. You go from volcano to mountains to ocean to lakes. Mm. Any kind of wine, red wine, uh, uh, white wine. Just all these different geographic regions. Different geographic regions. So uh, it's this triangular shape that is um, right the center. Uh, We call the Kula del Mediterraneo. Kula is the crib. Because mm. we were pampering yeah, everybody. Like the breadbasket almost. Yes, everybody. The, so the, the, the Finnish were coming, the Vikings were coming, and they were <laughs> finding this right. welcoming little crib. The Africans were coming, they were finding this welcome little crib. Huh. The Greeks were coming. We have so many Roman and Greek theaters on that portion of the island, on the east portion where I'm from. On the west portion, besides some uh, uh, Greek theaters, we have a Casbah in many, in many cities. Hmm. And they have been there for five, six hundred years. Hmm. And so is this, you know, uh, association of people of different uh, nationalities putting all together. So it's really, it's, it's, Italy's had effective control over it for quite a while, but ultimately it's a, it's a melting pot like no other almost. Correct. It's a melting pot because it was this beautiful island. Yeah. Now think about Italy was unified in the middle of 1800. And so up until then, oh, up until then, we had a king on the north portion of Italy. And up until then, from Naples down, they belong to the Spaniard, to the Aragonese. Oh, is that right? The Aragon- Until oh. the, Italy was united. So even though there was the, the Roman Empire, if you will, uh, in the Catholic kind of, but as far as uh, states, it wasn't that it was way. was the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Ah. Spain and Naples down south and grabbing Sicily as well. Interesting. So yes. how, how many people uh, live on Sicily? Oh, the island is big. I mean, the biggest city is Palermo and us probably 4 million people, 3 okay. million people. So maybe 30 million or 50 million yep, people all together. Yeah, it's bigger than, it's big as Colorado, I think, yeah. Sicily. Yes, yeah, cool. beautiful island, beautiful island. Fascinating. So what was your family into? You, you were in the east, you said? I was in the tip east of Sicily, northeast corner of Sicily. And we had this ferry to take to go on motherland, on Italy. Mm. It's two kilometers, three kilometers, sorry. Oh. Uh, so you put your car and the train on the ferry, and you cross this. Oh, very narrow straight, straight. Yes, really. Yes, very narrow straight. And so um, uh, I grew up there, and so I was involved. I was interested in folk music, in researching the old traditional sing- mm. songs in Sicily. Mm-hmm. So I had this group of research of music in Sicily. Interesting. And so I... This is like as a, as a late as a teen? Hobby. Yes, I was 20s, 14. Okay. 14. <laughs> so I played the piano growing up. I learned guitar. And with this group, I started playing percussion. It's mm. a specific instrument called tamburello. It's a tambourine. Mm-hmm. It's a frame drum. And uh, there is a Sicilian technique, mm. the Calabria technique, the Napolitan technique, the Puglia technique. And I don't know why I was able to pick up all those techniques anyway. So uh, in my life as a musician, also I was lucky enough that at a certain point, I was 19, I got in touch with the most famous group of early music in the world. Interesting. Interesting. So I went to a selling class and I fell in love with this lady from Rome whose brother uh, was a bass player in the European orchestra with the famous director von Karajan. Okay. And after that, he switched to viola and he went to study in uh, Switzerland uh, with his famous uh, director of early music. Uh, one day she called me and said, Antonio, I remember you play percussion. They need a percussionist. <laughs> That's familiar so, with early music. So, okay. <laughs> I was not. Oh. So uh, can you come to Rome in a week and they want to test you? So, okay. So this gentleman from Spain um, called me and say I will be in front of the Pantheon. I will be reading El País, this magazine from Spain, and I will see you there at 9 o'clock in the morning. Okay. Okay. So I took an overnight train. Uh, I spot this gentleman in the middle of the square. We had breakfast together. And, uh, <clears throat> he, of course, he was speaking five languages, so we were talking in Italian then. And uh, he asked me, well, where can we see the way you play? Now, I don't know if you have been to Rome, this Pantheon. It's this beautiful place, and there are many columns. Yeah. And I told him, why don't we go in between those columns? And he <laughs> said, why not? Yeah. So he asked me, can you take this rhythm? Sure. Can you take this rhythm? Sure. Can you t- of course. Remember, I was 
my first year of medical school, so I was 17 or 18. And he asked me, how much is your honorarium per concert? Hmm. And I told him, well... What's you, that? This, well, <laughs> say, whatever you pay the other musician, I will get the same honorarium. Good idea. Wow. Um, guess what? A month later, he called me, and I started playing with him, and I played with him for more than 10 years. Oh, wow. And I recorded many LP and CDs with him. Oh, wow. And this, again, it was this... He still is the most famous uh, player of early music. You, my sense is you have a really strong ability to just repeat back or, or just to understand the, the, the beats and the things. Like, uh, not quite a, uh, what's that term they use for real music gurus? Well, I, I had music with me, uh, uh, and I studied piano, so I was reading music. I studied guitar, and uh, actually I arrived to the percussion field just because a friend of mine couldn't play anymore. I said, well, you know, I feel I can do that. And I was able to just That's what I'm in. saying, yeah. And I became very proficient and, uh, well, and I yeah. enjoyed that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, did. yeah. Well, it, it seems like it's almost like the, the science somehow made sense to you. Yes, uh, the science made sense. The, 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 the reading made sense. So I can, I see the time going and I apply my knowledge and I enjoy that and I, it's time. Is it, it is visual time. for you? music it's, a little bit like flipping that baby it, on the delivery it is very visual and it's very emotional yeah um again in the darkness of my mind i s was seeing that baby in the uh, a moment of uh, during a concert i see the music and i feel people yeah and so it's a combination that mm. enriches me so I mean, the, the emotions of the people pouring out at you is part they of what me. yeah yeah you know, I don't know if... Are you into music? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love to sing. Uh, I'm not a musician are, are you, yet. Uh, am but... I going to listen to you singing now? Well, no, right? Know. No, 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 right? Not no, yet. no, We don't no. have time. We don't... Okay, good. Whew. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay. No. no uh, um, you know, when you play a concert, especially an acoustic concert, you play in big churches, mm -hmm. and you don't have any microphone. Mm -hmm. And so you play for somebody. So somebody picks you from the audience, and mm. they start looking at you. So it's... And you feel honored by somebody is following you. And, you know, there is somebody that follows the cello, somebody mm. that plays the piano. Sure. And so every single time I play, there is somebody in the audience that interacts with me. Hmm. And so I connect. Oh, connect. It's not just table tennis. Connect. You know, <laughs> yeah. think about it. It's a human connection. That is, has sure. been my, um, the most important thing in life. Can you... Uh... Do a, a brief example of some of the music that was traditional in this place. Is it just strictly acoustics, or is it is it singing too? No, there was a soprano. Uh, his wife was a famous, famous soprano. Oh. So it's music from. You're probably from, not a soprano, though. Uh, not to my knowledge. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> uh, so it's music from the 1400. Oh wow. 1415, in the kingdom of the two Sicily. Remember, this guy's from Only Spain. Only those two places. Yeah, with the entire kingdom of Spain and uh, uh, southern Italy, and so they were this renaissance music mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. and so um was it orchestra style or how do you it was an orchestra it? so there are three viola da gamba the viola is the yeah, uh, little... parents of all the um arc instrument like cello violin bass okay. um and there is the trombone and the trumpet those are original instrument mm. from 1400 mm. this gentleman had a short viola big like a violin yeah he was in the airplane with him it was uh, built in Venice around 14 something. <laughs> so we were paying the ticket for De Viola sitting close to him. All right. And uh, um, all the original instrument was ridiculous. Hmm. Uh, so yeah, the trombone, uh, the fagot, uh, the uh, cornet, uh, percussion, hmm. uh, beautiful, beautiful instrument. Oh, fascinating. So it wasn't just of this style, it was also using this really the original. ancient instruments. Now, if you think about all the modern instruments, also the, if you think about the guitar, guitar comes from lute or from the vihuela, mm -hmm. and so there are, those are the original instruments, the original string instrument. So there are this long, long lute, short lute, the vihuela is a little bit uh, flatter, and uh, you go to the trombone. trombone. The original trombone came from that time. Hmm. Very interesting. I would like to spend 30 minutes here, but uh, oh. then we'll run out of time. Um, but we still got some time left. But tell me about, so you're in medical school, but you also go on this 10-year professional music so ride. So uh, in my first year of medical school, uh, when I went back to music, 
I wonder, should I switch to music? Mm. Uh, because I realized that my technique all over Europe, there were no many people playing my technique. Yeah. So in the world of early music, I could have done something there. But, you know, my love for medicine was strong. And guess what? I was able to manage both of them. Mm. It was really intense. <laughs> I'm sure. So I remember being in Barcelona, in Spain, at the Sagrada Familia, in this amazing place, and uh, in between rehearsal, I was studying the amino acids metabolism. <laughs> so I was with my book on a bench studying this thing. So right. I was always traveling with my book. Yeah. Because before going or after coming back, I had a test. And I had to catch up. Uh, but I was able to manage both of them. And, you know, a friend of mine were kind of, Antonio, I cannot believe you just came back and you did this test and was very good in medicine. <laughs> right. Or, oh my gosh, now you're going back again playing and... Remember, you've I mean, barely practiced. You've been studying all week. And I was, <laughs> and I was really uh, paid in Deutschmark then. Oh, so at that time, uh, you know, we, uh, Europe was very wasn't, strong currency. Yes, versus Europe the... was not united, so we right. didn't have the euro. Right, and so Deutschmark, I was <laughs> able to buy my first computer. You, you always had a fat pocket. Yes, because it was full I was of able marks. to <laughs> yeah. to buy my first computer, to buy my Vespa. It's still with me. So I was getting some independence yeah. at that time yeah. uh, for a kid of eighteen years old. I mean, we're, was was very yeah unique. well in Italy right yeah. now it's like thirty two year olds are still living with their even parents. more yes <laughs> even older than that yes <laughs> so um, yeah tell me about that that journey from there did you um, did you meet your partner early on has she been with you forever or? well no my uh, uh, current partner actually I met her eleven years ago okay um, so in my I finished my medical school I won a grant I went to Milano I learned something in Milano. I finished my residence in Milano, and through the Milano Connections, I did my first fellowship here in the U.S. Mm. I went to Oregon. Okay. Uh, my English was very, almost zero. Zero minus zero. Well, you, you call it. <laughs> and uh, um, so I did a fellowship. And what is this? This is like... 1991. Wow. So I was 28, 29. And uh, so I spent one year in Oregon. I went back to Milano. And uh, my, I had no position still at the university. So after one year, I did another fellowship here in Denver. Mm. Actually, I went to Denver. And after two years, I went back to Milano. I finally got my position at the university. And uh, one day, uh, my mentor called me in my office and said, Antonio, uh, can I send you a resident to do an elective time with you? Mm. So, Whoa, okay. So that was Friday afternoon. I went to the airport Tuesday morning with a cardboard box in my hand Say, okay, American Airlines numbered this. I had a name, first name, Julie. Okay, so here comes this Julie getting out of the airplane. She finds me, and uh, she was this resident here from, from Colorado that spent six weeks with me learning this um, uh, specific technique to assess fetal well-being. Okay. And, uh, well, I fall in love with this lady. Oh. Oh. And so <laughs> she had to move back here to Denver. She had to finish her residency, and uh, once she finished, she joined me in Italy. Oh. So we got married, and we had two kids. Mm. But my second kid was born just after 9-11. Mm. And so Julie didn't want to stay anymore here in the U.S. Mm. And so I was a chairman in Italy at the age of 39, so it's very rare. Uh, but uh, I packed my house, and we came back here with mm. a one-month-old kid. It and sounds like you were a little bit begrudging of uh, it. No, it was, time, was intense. It was intense for me. But, you know, I always say, okay, life can start tomorrow from yeah. scratch. So I came back here. I had a visiting professor position for one and a half year. Mm. I had to redo my test. Mm. The test I'm Future boards done. or whatever. Yeah. No, yet. I asked to qualify as a medical student. Oh. And after one and a half year, I restarted my residency oh my so the so, people so you went kind of from like from uh -huh. eight down to a two or something and zero again path. here we go yeah. zero again so the people that were my student when i was a visiting professor until june 16 here comes june 18 and they are my boss <laughs> so i redid my residency and uh, uh was more than 80 hours per week uh but you know i take any experience uh in a positive way. It yeah. was, in, was tough. Um, I learn always from anybody. So I put myself always in this learning mo mode. Uh, okay, I need to spend this time. Okay, I'm sure I will learn something. How I'm fast sure. was your English coming along? Uh, at that time, it was kind of decent. Yeah. Uh, I was communicating with people. As a matter of fact, I mean... Uh, Falling in love with an American woman probably yes. helped. 
He did. Uh, <laughs> a lot of phone calls and whatnot. He did help, yes. But after uh, one year after my residency, our relationship started falling apart, so we got divorced. Hmm. And uh, that was really the toughest thing that happened in my life. Yeah. Very tough. I never thought of that. Your I kids mean, were pretty young. I, my kids were young, and I was 43. I mean, I waited so long to get married. I yeah. was yeah. 38 when I got married. And so that was the biggest failure of my life. What, uh, like, when you recant it now, like, what do you think your contribution to that failure was? <laughs> Excuse Just... me. I'm sure it was at least 50%. I mean, there is nothing nothing we can say. Was it because you were older and kind of stuck in your no, ways? No, no, we were probably like too, too much stubborn for each other. Yeah. And so... Um, Two hard heads uh, Two hard, yeah. have a tough time and together we, we were unable to communicate, and this mm. was affecting the quality of life for everybody. Yeah. So was that my ideal situation? No, but I had to take it. So it goes. And, yeah. uh, and that's it. So now I've been in this relationship with this beautiful and amazing lady. Her name is Gail, uh, for 11 years. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, um, no more kids along the line? You have two no, kids? No, we have two. She has two. So we have okay. four kids. Yeah, yeah. Three are 21 years old. Oh, wow. My son and her two kids they are a set of twins, yeah. beautiful twins, a boy and girl. And my daughter is going to be 23. She works in Chicago. She just finished college last year and she found a job right away. So we are very proud of our family. Our kids are completely different from each other. Uh, never in the last 11 years, one conflict. Uh, we travel well together. Mm, um, nice. We like to explore uh, the diversity <laughs> within our family. Uh, we have fun. Awesome. Enjoy that. That's really cool. This episode is sponsored by Loco Think Tank. Loco Think Tank provides peer collaboration for business owners. We build smart, safe places to help business leaders navigate every stage of the business journey, and we love what we do and who we do it with. Our model features gift back minded business veterans in the role of Loco facilitators, and we're always looking for abundance minded individuals to add to our membership, facilitator team, Loco community, or to feature on this podcast. Listeners of this podcast who go on to become members of Loco Think Tank get their sixth month of membership for free. Just mention the Loco Experience podcast on your application. To learn more, visit our website at locothinktank.com. That's L-O-C-O thinktank.com. Um, tell me about, like, you, obviously, even though you reset your career basically back to zero, you were, because you opened the banner hospital oh, yeah, here, oh, yeah. and, like, you had a lot of amazing career points <laughs> yes. from our coffee, I remember. So, <laughs> and you wrote 150 papers. Like, yeah, what did you really become an expert in? books as well. Um, <laughs> so what I did, I was working uh, in uh, um, Frisco. I had my practice in Frisco. Okay. But I met Gail, and she was here in Fort Collins. Mm. So to get closer to her, uh, I found a, a location, a, a position in the banner um, system in Greeley. Okay. So I started working in Greeley, but I was really driving Greeley, Denver with my kids, uh, uh, for Collins, really, Denver for Collins was intense. <laughs> and so I, uh, the, the banner system was opening up at, uh, an hospital here. So I told them, said, guys, uh, I'm still young. <laughs> I'm the obvious. I am full too. of energy. And the first time they told me, well, we are looking for a lady, not for a man. I said, okay. So may I ask you why? Uh, well, that's what we decided. Okay. Uh, I was on call one night, and uh, the administrator person called me and said, Antonio, are you interested in that position still? I said, of course. I mean, you know that I can cover from A to Z. And you are walking in Fort Collins from scratch, and the other system, the PBH, is really offering every single thing. <laughs> right. Um, and they said, position is yours. <laughs> so uh, what I did before I moved to Fort Collins, uh, we were building the, the, the hospital, so it was me... Uh, a pediatrician, an intensive care unit specialist, a ER, and a surgeon. Mm. Those were the five persons that started the hospital. And uh, um, I came here before. I just wanted to see what the community was. Sure. So I introduced myself to the different physician, family practice physician. I say, my services are here for anybody. Yeah. And you touched something very important earlier on about the less uh, underserved people. Yeah. Uh, I went to introduce myself to the physician working at the Salud Clinic mm -hmm. here up north. Mm -hmm. And actually, a lady that was one of my students when I was working in Denver, she wasn't attending there. So thank you so much for coming here because we really, nobody ever showed up here and you are the first one mm. offering your service here. So guys, here I am and our hospital will 
help you anything we, any way we can. And so I was very proud of that. Yeah. And I worked very hard and I enjoyed uh, every single moment of my working. I've hours. never really thought about how uh, entrepreneurial opening a, a new facility location like that really was. <laughs> like, not just you, but the pediatrician and this and that. Like, you had was to go yes, shake the bushes a little bit to try to find some customers. Otherwise, this expensive building is going to struggle. Let, let me tell you, I mean, our service was the only one able to make hand and meats. Hmm. How do you say? Hands and meat? Yeah. Uh, ends meat? Ends meat. Yeah. And, ends meat. Be profitable? Yes. And uh, it was interesting. We were supporting the entire hospital in the first four or five months. Oh, wow. And it was very nice. Yeah. So, and that just kind of, you know, so tell me about these books that you've written. Like, well, you're, you're obviously an expert at some things around this space. So, Well, what? I produce many pub- scientific publications. And uh, I, when I was 29, I invented something in the field of aesthetics. Okay. So when you deliver a baby. I haven't you, yet. You have not yet? No, not oh, yet. Well, probably later I on hope to, to Probably still. later on today. I mean, I st- baby. the day is still long. <laughs> the day is still long in front of you. When a person delivers a baby. <laughs> when yeah. a person delivers a baby. Uh, we have a very subjective assessment. So the baby's coming in, into the birth canal, mm-hmm. and we assess with our finger Many things, uh, the position of the baby, mom's dilatation. We are more of an artisan there. We are really using our tactile sensation. Mm. And well, so that's not here. It's also on the belly. Okay. But through the vaginal canal, yeah, we yeah. assess certain You're, things. Yeah. Also feel bony part of a mom, right, the, right. the head of the baby, the skull of the baby. Right. But it's very subjective. It's sure. very, it may be sometimes wrong as yeah. well. Yeah, if you do it a thousand times, you're probably barely ever wrong, but the first 50 or 100 or 200 yeah, but times... Yeah, you being right means that you are wrong, and vice uh-huh. versa. If you're right, I am wrong, right. because you're assessing... Okay, if I want to measure you, I put you against the wall, and I put a measuring tape, I say, you are 6'2". Yep. Instead of saying, oh, you and may be six and a half, or you may be seven and seven, or you may be four. That, right. That's just my assessment. So... Uh, um. I discovered that if I was placing an ultrasound probe on mom's pubic bone, I could see how the baby was coming down. Mm. So when mom pushed the baby in the last phase of uh, labor, the baby doesn't come down into the birth canal in a straight way. It's like a screw. It's rotating. Mm. And it's using the mom's pubic bone as a fulcrum mm-hmm. and comes out. As a around the corner. extending. <laughs> yeah. The baby's extending. Uh, so when mom pushes, the baby doesn't oh. have a straight uh, yeah. uh, direction as an angular direction. Mm-hmm. So I invented this angle of progression. Hmm. I was measuring an angle. Okay, we are, I am 29 or 30, and uh, I present this data at the first World Congress on Labor and Deliver. Okay. I had to fight with my uh, uh, chairman in Milan, who was a big person, big personality as well, because he wanted to present this data. I said, listen, those are my data. I am a little kid, I know, but just let me do that, right? You know, in Italy, there is always this yeah, the- hierarchy. So I present these nine minutes uh, uh, data, and the audience was silent. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Did I say that? At a certain point, a gentleman stands up and starts clapping hmm. by himself. Once he's done clapping, everybody starts clapping, and he keeps talking. I say, guys, you, all of you are so old. This guy now is showing us what we have been imagining for centuries. He's showing mm. exactly what's happening. I wish I would have known you when I invented my device. Now, who was this guy? It was a famous guy from Australia that invented a suction device that helped us mm. deliver a baby. Mm-hmm. It's all over the world. Yeah. Say, oh my gosh, Antonio, I just published my DVD and you are showing me, you are letting me see what I always was thinking. Yeah. Okay, so I was young. I was finally uh, debuting on the stage of, with this invention and people all over the world will say, oh my gosh, Antonio, really, really, really? Well, after five years, a gentleman from Berlin uh, bought a DVD that actually published here in the US <laughs> and started using my technique. So he got in touch with me and said, oh my gosh, Antonio, that's very this revolutionary. This is way better. Yeah. Yes. And so the, we were five or six people all over the world, a few in Italy, one in Israel and Germany, another guy in Finland. They started using this technique. And after 10 years or more, we finally met in the same place in Italy. 
And I created this society, scientific society called ILANS, International Society of Labor and Delivery Ultrasound. Mm. So we are all the experts in the world using this technique. Mm. And is and that so, why people were coming to Italy to residency with you? And no, stuff? They, you... they were learning something else at okay. that time. <laughs> <laughs> at that time, they were learning something else. And so uh, uh, I invented this thing. And yeah. uh, so all over the world, it's called Angolo Progression. Oh, as a matter of fact, I just received an email today, uh, a gentleman from... Japan yeah. that met me in that meeting asked me to co-author with him one of his paper in the uh, yeah. National Japanese Society about this thing, yeah. and I just received an email today. It was published. <laughs> cool. So, do you get paid uh, anything for that? No, of course not. Do you get any royalties no, from no, this no, whole no, thing? No, no. None of that. The problem was that that I didn't. Um, how do you say? I didn't. Like I didn't. Or I didn't patent that. Yeah. Because that was an intellectual property. Sure. And I didn't. But I'm a little you know, surprised that your medical system didn't patent it. Well, remember, know. I was a little kid then. Right, right. And so and until one day, somebody, some ultrasound company, actually was showing me such specific <laughs> images that they took from, over the internet. Say, man, where do you take those images? Right. Oh, from the internet. Say, you know who this hand is? It's mine. <laughs> those were my fingers in this video that I produced. Those are my fingers. Oh, that's my blue shirt. How do you get those? And so at that point, you know, I would say, okay, yeah, that's water under the bridge, whatever. I suppose. Yes. Yeah. So cool. Um, so t I guess uh, I I'm feeling like we could tell stories in medicine all day. Other other highlights from your medical career or publishing? Oh my gosh, yeah. I, when I moved from Sicily to Milano and uh, I switched my residency there because uh, this professor wanted me there with him, uh, we were trying to keep the small babies in mom's uterus until they were able to... Keep them from being too premature. From being too premature, correct. But they were not growing well. So the dilemma was, what are we doing with these mm. babies? Mm -hmm. If they keep them inside mom's belly, they may die. If they, we get them out too soon, the neonatologists at that time were unable to take care of these kids. Yeah. So for us, prematurity was 32 weeks. Now we deliver a baby at 24 weeks. Right. But then... The neonatologist said, we don't know what to do. The right. mortality was so high. So we were trying to feed the babies. Yeah, like supplemental feeding almost. Supplemental feeding. So we were cannulating the umbilical cord through mom's belly and feeding this baby with amino acids. Wow. And so I was going all over Italy talking about the relationship between these amino acids, this metabolism of these fetuses, and the way I was recording the blood flow in the fetal circulation. Again, I was a little kid going all over Italy. <laughs> My mentor was a, a, um, an amazing guy at the University of Milan. He taught me many things. And so we were producing a bunch of publications on that. Yeah. And so we were going all over the world talking about this. That's pretty cool. What, a, what cool. a journey. Very cool. Well, and, and I think, you know, it could well be your most impactful days are still ahead of you. With I hope so. Otherwise, what do they mean? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I, hope so. yes. I hope so. So um, we always, as you know, talk about faith, family, and politics okay. in this program. And um, I don't know if you, as much or as little, do you uh, have things you'd like to say? We talked about me, your family. Ask me anything you want. Let's talk about your family you. a little bit more. You've got uh, your two kids, and it sounds like you're very close to your, your stepkids as well. Yes. Uh, I always ask for a one-word description of each child. Okay. Are you up for that challenge? Marina is very shy, very sensitive, uh, beautiful. I deliver, I deliver my two kids myself. Oh. I wouldn't have passed that for any reason in the world. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, so uh, Marina is the joy of my life. Um, she's shy. She's like me. She's Even if I talk, I mean, I'm very introverted and shy, mm. believe, it, believe it or not. Yeah. I can still beat you at ping pong, but yeah, I'm still well, we'll shy. See I'm this. still shy. <laughs> Um, William is very athletic. Hmm. I mean, you give him anything in sports and he will excel. Hmm. Out of the blue. Pick it right up. Um, he was in elementary school, I think third grade, and this lady went to propose fencing to the school. So William started fencing and she asked me, where have you been fencing? Which club do you go? <laughs> Who taught so, him? Man, that's the first time I touched this thing. <laughs> so that's William. Uh, Max is um, very artsy. Hmm. Um Gail is um, from the Chicasso Nation. So mm. Max, you look at him, and he's as very, a feature very peculiar of indigenous population. Yeah, yeah. And has this long hair, dark and skinny and very fancy and very stylish. Yeah, yeah. And he's studying industrial design. Oh, cool. 
And uh, Sophie is in Boulder, and uh, uh, she is amazing. She was very introverted when I met her. Mm. Actually, when I met her, she was riding a lot. I said, mm. my gosh, this girl rides so well. And uh, her mom and I were thinking, oh, man, she may get into riding. Now she's doing environmental studies. Mm. So our family, again, being very diverse, we are very united. Yeah. And, uh, and we enrich each other. Uh, last Christmas, uh, we decided, okay, instead of just buying silly presents, why don't we buy a book? Think of the other person that is receiving the book. Mm. So each of us book a little, uh, bought a little book. It doesn't matter if it was used, secondhand, doesn't matter. It was supposed to be given to you. And so I need to buy the book thinking of you. Yeah. It was a very nice experience. I like um, that. Yeah. We are very symbolic in our I like family. that line you just used, that diverse and united. I Absolutely. Mean, that describes not just a great family, but a great state, a great country, you know, a, a great island, whatever. Anything. We are enriching each a other. staff. Yes, constantly. A team. Yes. Uh, whatever. Whatever. I Indeed. like it. Yeah. So, um, and let's talk a little bit about your, your partner, Gail. Uh, what... Uh, what was it that connected you guys at first, those we 11 years ago? We met through a common friend and a uh, very artsy person. Uh, I think Gail is the most beautiful soul I have ever met. Hmm. She's very pure, um, very authentic, uh, very real. Um, when I met her, she was starting her business. Now, she's in, she has a, her own business here in town, and she's very proud of that. Um, she has a workroom uh, of interior design. Oh. So she works... Uh, uh, Can I give it a plug or anything like that? She yes. A uh, her, uh, her, uh, her business is called Sparrow House of Design. Oh. I know who that is. She has a work... Actually, I think you know her. Yeah, I do. You, uh, 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 you do know her. She told me about you. Uh, oh, I'd say... Years I met, ago, I probably. Met years ago, <laughs> yes. So she has a workroom and a showroom. Yeah. Uh, women's business. Uh, very proud of that. Very, very... Um, Specific, very uh, precise. She just wants to do the job in the best way she yeah, can. Yeah, an amazing designer too. Like some of the, her creations are. And, like and over her the top. mind is really, really so, so beautiful. Yeah, she's a charmer. I feel enriched by the pre her presence in my life. Awesome, that's great to hear. Um, do you want to talk about faith or politics next? Oh, well, I grew up in a Catholic country, so yeah. I was everybody's raised, Roman Catholic. There, I was much. raised Catholic. Um, since I moved here in the U.S. Uh, I would say I'm not practicing Catholicism, okay. but I still feel I am a spiritual person. I always care about the soul beyond your face. Yeah. You, it, you still think Jesus is a good guy? Uh, I think that if you read the gospel, whatever this Jesus did was, he was the first revolutionary person. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I cannot find anything that he says, whoever says that, and if Jesus did, uh, that is wrong. I mean, <laughs> it's so pure. But it's yeah. very pure. It's very black and white. And it's free. It's free of any kind of notions. Like when he's questioned by people that are trying to trap him and stuff like that, he pure. cannot be trapped. Pure. <laughs> yeah. In his simplicity, because the mm. message is very simple. Mm -hmm. The message is one. Love the other people like you love yourself. Yeah. No, and I now, love God you, more, and than, you can be more than you. <laughs> Christian and you can be Jewish. You can be anything you want. Sure. Yeah. But... You are my Jesus. You are my God. Means I, we are in this hurt passage, hmm. and I'm giving something to you. So if indeed you are, you are built to resemble God. Yeah, in the image of. You are in the image of. Yeah. That's, you are my God. I think that's one of the things that's so fascinating in this kind of equal rights and equality and equity and, and conversation, and the Christians are kind of pushed over on the right, but... Like that notion that we are all created equal, it's because God created us that way. It's not necessarily, you know, and that's, I don't know, to me that's kind of a dichotomy that those that have most rejected God are kind of trumpeting this equality. But, but really what makes us equal is kind of that notion that we're created that way. Indeed. But we as human beings maneuver and uh, use, use and abuse mm. Anything, every single thing to our to <laughs> our favor. So, the Roman Church was an amazing power oh, over huge. the centuries. Yeah. So any religion has the power of influencing people. Now, I don't want to cite Marx, but the point is that there is a political influence. Oh, for sure. 
there is a human influence. So if I am a human being behind, uh, uh, if I be, will become Pope in the next week, I probably, uh, who knows? It's unlikely, who but knows? You Unli- know, unlikely. more likely that I'm going to deliver a baby. Okay, more <laughs> likely. Okay. But the point is, it's me, right? So I bring my knowledge, I bring my, my background, and, sure. and I need to push your business because you are my friend. So that is the power right. of <laughs> the corruptibility. That is the, the corruptibility. Yeah. But if we go back to the purity of the message, yeah, fair. the simple is I need to love you. I don't want to love you like I love myself. Yeah. So that is my spirituality. As much as, again, now we are a fault all day long, right? We are. Sure. We are. And People we like to ask, you know, when somebody says, how, how are you doing? Uh, I always say, better than I deserve. You know, we make mistakes. <laughs> yeah, yes, we yeah. make mistakes. And we, our arrogance our individualism, mm. our uh, egoism. Um, mm. So if we have time to think about, okay, how poorly did I behave today? Come on, let me be yeah. better tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Or even, I cannot wait until tomorrow. Let me be better now. If I'm able to realize how miserable I behaved earlier on, I need to change. It feels like we may have swung a little too much to the side of individuality and and not recognizing enough how essential connections are and how we're not just I wrote a blog some months ago I guess probably last July it was called Liberty from Liberty like don't imagine that you actually are this like self-contained island that can manage things all on your own correct we that, can't it is the any amazing more than we're, arrogance yes any more than that we're fully part of the collective correct and that they should manage all of us for us you know it has to be both I am always right. Didn't we say that? <laughs> no, I'm always right. Oh, you are. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Oh, at least are? on my podcast. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but I'm always right while I am on your podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so that is the point. So if we don't confront each other mm-hmm. and we don't s- step in in that process, yeah, engage saying, in discourse. I need to respect you first. Yeah, yeah. Let me listen to you. And what do you actually think? Let yes. me listen to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we may disagree, but from our disagreement, we can build something good. Yeah is just the possibility of communicating, just the possibility of connecting that allows us to move forward in any direction, yeah, yeah. in a positive, <laughs> constructive way. I was just thinking about that notion of where two or more are gathered, God is there too. And it Correct. kind of is a real thing. You know, it, there's it is a real More thing. than just two people's worth of it stuff going thing. on when yes. you're connecting. It is a real thing. Yeah. That's why I was telling you earlier on, I need to be surrounded by people that share the same vision and we need to be together. We need to put our energy together. Yeah, yeah. Oh, talking of which, uh, I've been pushing nowadays these cross-sector communication. So mm. if I talk about always multiple sclerosis with people with multiple sclerosis, yeah. you're going to get old on that. If you live with Parkinson and talk always with people with Parkinson, you're going to stay in that. Yeah. Uh, so I create this silly umbrella. Uh, I physically create this umbrella that was made in India uh, with my logo and the logo of the three different organizations, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, and Parkinson, under the same umbrella. Mm. Let's stop building fences. Let's be together in this backyard. And I bought the barbecue is cooking. You bring me your food. I bring mine and somebody else. <laughs> so we yeah. have different spices in life. But guess what? We are the same. We are this human being experiencing this meal. So on uh, based on your experience, who's the best at ping pong? Is the... Uh, dementia patients, the Parkinson's, or the... <laughs> you know what? It's, it's it's and who responds the fastest and how? Like, what have you seen in that so, regard? So let me tell you. So this group with mild <laughs> cognitive impairment, yeah, arrived and they arrived once, and I said, oh my gosh, the ability, their their um, oh my gosh, uh, the um, it's not the synchronism, it's like the, their physical abilities or whatever they're clean. Compared yeah. to us with multiple sclerosis and people living with a Parkinson, yeah. so it was easier for them to do the specific exercise. Yeah. Now, to understand the exercise, it took a little to bit longer. It, things like that. Yeah. But so what? So and guess what? If I need to explain the same thing to you, I can use one of my four languages that I speak five, or I use signs, or I use colors, or I use music. Mm. If I want to communicate with you. I will find the mean of communication. Yeah, yeah. That is the point. I mean, the wall in front of me now between you and me in communicating, I will put it down. If I want to communicate <laughs> with you, I will go around. I will make a drill. I will drill the hole. I will do something. Yeah, yeah. My desire is to communicate with you. Period. Oh, I've uh, 
I, I buy my tortillas at uh, Las Delicias Americas or I whatever. Do and the I best. do too. I do too. And I remember an exchange one time where there was a, 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 a challenging customer ahead of me and the the owner wanted to take them because she had better skills. And so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and this young lady that didn't have very good English, like we did this little dance and, and we communicated and so much without any words being understood between the two of us. Like we both knew exactly what the other person meant the whole time. Because you want to. Because we wanted to. Correct. Yeah. The first step is always, there is a line there. Do mm. I want to do it? Do I want to cross that line? Yeah. Do I want to do it? Yes. Get yeah. dirty. Find well, something. Well, you see, some people get angry when they're forced to cross that line. Oh, that, you know, that person didn't even have any English down oh, there that, at the that, shop or whatever. You know, that's, that's arrogance. Dumb. Yeah. That's arrogance. Well, or fear more. You want to know something about this thing? Yeah. Once I participated in this Father's Day event at my son's school. Okay. There was having poker game and ping pong game. Oh. So I played with this kid and I won. And uh, my son was at the table and he heard this kid talking to his dad saying, oh my gosh, I lost with that guy. And he doesn't even speak English. That was mm. me, right? Yeah. And my son heard that and I said, okay, William, how do you feel about that? I mean, you know my accent. Oh, don't worry about that. that pa. I mean, they are ignorant and there is nothing we can do. And of course, I played against his dad that was very upset, and, and I won. Yeah. And I went to shake my hand, and he didn't want to shake my hand. Say, said, sir, we are in front of kids. Why are you going? Why do I need yeah. to chase you to shake your hands? Show something to these kids what we do as adults. Behave as an adult, please. Yeah, it's sad. Uh, uh, so it's really... Uh, but I, I like that you called it out. I did. You know... But not for me. <laughs> yeah. Not for me, but we are in front of an audience of kids. Yeah. And you need to give an example. Yeah. We are having a, a social event. We are playing a sport. Shake my hand. Yeah, be a sportsman. Yeah. Shake my hand. Yes. Um, well, I think that covers well the kind of faith and spirit and okay. notions. Um, politics. Okay. What do you want to know? I don't know. Um, what do you think about our American system in comparison to the Italian system? Um there are some big differences in the legal system. Mm. Very, very big difference. I mean, in terms of the different court level, the federal court, the judge, mm. and the local, the state. Um, remember, we arrived to the European community, uh, I don't remember, probably 10 years ago? No, I left yeah, the year, yeah, maybe, yeah, 10 yeah. years ago. And uh, when I was a kid, I, we were dreaming of this European community. But um, so now we have an European court as sure. well. So the legal system is very different. What I like about the uh, American society is that the daily life is easy. Hmm. Much easier than in even in my country, in Italy. Yeah. But there are procedures. Like greater comforts and things like that? Uh, or what do you the, mean? The easier? easy life in any public office, believe it or hmm. not. So that's what, those are your rights. I go there. I need this, this, and this. Hmm. And the service will be offered to you. Yeah. But if something is a little bit different, there is a comma that is different, you don't get anything. Yeah. Now, in Italy, those are your service. Ah, okay, but today is Tuesday, really? And uh, there is always something going on. Yeah. But people, people may add the comma that was missing there. Me means people mm. go beyond because... Mm. Interesting. Yeah, the, the, the rule doesn't allow me to do that, but let me see what I can do for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So again, is the person, the single individual... It's ultimately relationship. That's all it is. The, the human being behind the rule, the human being behind that position that is indeed making the well, difference. Well, that makes us so corruptible, right? It, In a way. I mean, it's... That goes back to the sincerity and to who you are. I mean, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. I can use and abuse that or I can be completely ignorant and leave you alone. Yeah. So it's us as human beings that make the difference. You know, sometimes it's a, I'm sorry, this is the, what's the word that has been used? Uh, uh, people hide themselves behind the corporation. Mm. Sorry, those are the corporation rules. Oh, sorry, yeah. Okay. But what about you? you? Because the corporate office is yours. You are in charge. Right. So what do you want to do? Do you see the problem? Do you want to change it? And so politics should be at service. As a politician, hmm. as a person in charge, as your leader, as your chairman, as a person in power, I am at your service. 
Yeah. Well, it's, that's that notion of, are you a civil servant or are you the person with power? Because they're, they're both and sometimes, well, right? Well, life, life gives you power. Life right now is giving you power to decide if we continue this podcast or sure. not. Sure, yeah. Right? And I have the power to say I do. So we have our own power. Right. But guess what? We decide that doesn't matter because we are communicating. Hmm. So if you have this tool, you have the power of the tool, right? You're offering that to me. You're giving me a service. Yeah, fair. You offered me this to, to offer me the possibility of express my idea. Mm. So you have a power, but you are administering that power in a, in a positive way, in a good way. Yeah. And again, for me, the most powerful person needs to be the one most at service. Do you, uh, yeah, no, I 100%. I think that's probably the biggest shame in America right now is that like it used to be people that would mostly go into politics would have like they've been successful in business and life and now they're 55 and they want to give back to their Let me community. give back. Correct. Let me give it back but to But now the, somebody's going to be digging through their phone records and all this and that, you know, and whatever and just it doesn't make it a very appealing thing because it's such a I think a microscope and, and then once they get into the the arena then there's you know always somebody throwing eggs or tomatoes at you. Okay, so do you want to fight, I apologize for the word, from within or from outside? Yeah, I don't know. That's a big question. I don't know either. That's one of my favorite definitions of politics is it's what we decided to develop so we didn't actually hack each other apart with swords. <laughs> you know, you know so what? that we can have debate and argumentation and, and have a, a system that... Yeah, you know, there's one word in the American dictionary that I cannot stand, arguing. Mm. I'm discussing with you. I'm not yeah. arguing. Even though you and I may have a different opinion, yeah. I don't want to argue with you. Yeah, yeah. Now, I may be passionate. I've been accused of... Or debate of, is, yes, is a more appropriate debate word. Debate is more appropriate. So in my medical committee, people were always, Antonio, you are the usual passionate person. Yeah, yeah. Say, guys, am I the one saying what everybody's thinking? And they were saying, yes. Okay. So you guys are passionate as well. I'm the one <laughs> voicing that. So I've been always in that position, and I pay for that, but I'm okay. Yeah, At yeah. the end of the day, when I go to sleep and I put my hand on the, on the pillow, say, okay, what did I do today? Yeah. Uh, do I regret something? And as I was telling you earlier on, if I realize that I need to regret something, I need to find a solution. Tomorrow cannot be the same mm. thing. So uh, politics and, and, and power needs to be given back. Mm. If I have a power... To change something, life is, somebody said, leave the world just a little bit better than what you found it. Yeah, yeah, or, or uh, you know, planting trees under whose shade you'll never rest. You can use so many... Uh, uh, those kinds of things. Those kind of things, yes. And, uh, you know, I gave um, a tapestry to my daughter. I, I bought this tapestry in Sicily. It has three different colors of green. Mm. Uh, coming from cucumber, from another plant, and from a spice, and represents an olive tree, mm. and was made by a community that was fighting against the mafia in Sicily. Mm. And I gave it to my daughter, and my daughter, even though I didn't agree about tattoos, she decided to have this olive tree on her skin. Oh. And so the embrace, embracing this concept is olive tree, symbol of peace. Mm -hmm. Let's I'm going to use the word saying fight. Let's make sure that we work for peace. No fight. That yeah. we work for peace. For. Um, have you ever been to Rotary Club, by the way? I've been to one Rotary Club. Actually, uh, last week there was a paper. Uh, 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 I was in the first page of the paper. I don't know if oh, you saw me. I did not. Oh, my gosh. I need to give it that. It was, I need to say thank you so much to this photo reporter. Um, in the first page was me, Tucker Carlson kicked out of uh, his <laughs> Fox. Uh, Fox. <laughs> And uh, Don Lemon kicked out of the <laughs> CNN. Oh, big news. And me, it, with my red shirt, talking Perfect. about this ping pong. Oh, that's great. Uh, and so after that, uh, and another Rotary, the Breakfast Rotary, got in touch with me. Oh, and they good. And they offered me, I'm going to give a talk on August 10th. Oh, good. I gave an, another talk to another of the, I think there are You were on my Rotary. list. I gave my Breakfast Rotary Club a list of people that, that Very nice. I knew that should be on there. So Very nice. So this lady called me and sent me an email awesome. and they great. invited me. Yes. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, well, and you should really consider whether Rotary might be a good organization for you to engage with on an individual basis. Because it is a global community, it's all about what can we do to actually inspire peace and diversity and a respect and understanding. And I don't know, you just you would jive with the cause, honestly. Well, didn't I tell you when I came here to, for, to work in Fort Collins, I came before the hospital was open to meet people. Mm. 
I was one of the members of the Project for Self-Sufficiency. Oh, yes, yes, Tracy. So, yeah. Yes. So I, wa- when I said, what can I do once I walk in this community? I want to feel part of the community. Yeah. So I was on the board, but I wasn't doing much. Yeah. I wasn't able to make this phone call for collecting money. I am a doer. And so, but that experience was very nice. I mean, it's very important that we give back. Yeah. And so a friend of mine that was on the same board invited me to the first uh, um, uh, Rotary mm. Club. Okay. And we are still friends. So oh, good. Well, know that uh, I think you would you would jive with the with the style of that club, and uh, you'd see Tracy regularly too. Amazing person. <laughs> she <laughs> is. Um, so let's jump into the loco experience, the, that craziest experience that you'd care to describe from your lifetime. Could be a day, a moment, a week. Um, could be. Well, well, there are so many. Today I was thinking about which one should I give. It, but if I, they are too crazy. So I'm gonna give you the latest. Okay. Uh, when I op- when I founded this organization, I had to find the roof, right? And I say, okay, well, I need to find tables as well. Sure. And I didn't tell that to Gail. So I I found a good deal with this um, company in Oregon, and I bought ten tables, the top of the tables. <laughs> I didn't have a roof where to place them. They didn't fit in my garage. So here they arrived outside my driveway, 10 boxes of this top of the table. <laughs> where do I put these things? Right. My wife arrived and said, oh my gosh, what are those things? Um, I just bought them. I said, Antonio, you put the cart in front of the horse. I said, Gail, I don't have a horse. <laughs> so I'm going to pull this cart. What can I do? I'm going to be the horse for a while. And where do we put them? So we had another friend at a three-car garage, two cars, said, can I please park my tables in your place? So she was not aware of my purchase. And then here we did with this big purchase that who knows when it's going to come back. But uh, And I had to find the roof, not only for the tables, but all, permanent for the table. Also, where do I park them now? Yeah. And she looked at me, okay, let me know next time. Okay, I will. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So uh, where are they now? Right now, they're in the Boys and Girls Oh, club. sure. That's yes. your permanent storage yeah. for them there. Great. Yeah. Well, um, I've really enjoyed the time. I, I'm thankful you made time for to share your story with more people. And uh, I, I can just really see bright things ahead for you and the communities that you're building around Tabletop Connections. So. Well, I share this enjoyment. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, one, because you let me free to express myself. You made me comfortable. Um, your place is comfortable, it's very cozy. And also, you allow me to share my experience, not only what I'm doing now, but also more personal yeah. with whoever is going to be listening to your podcast. Well, I know so, it'll be impactful. And uh, um, if we get you out of here soon, we have time for a real quick game, right? Maybe? Actually, I give Probably you... Probably not. I, no, no, I'm going to give you the time to play. One quick lesson? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Chris. It's been a great. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Godspeed. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Loco Experience Podcast, produced and sponsored by Loco Think Tank. This is your producer, Alma Ariana. Check out our website at thelocoexperience.com to find all of our episodes, nominate future guests, or leave us a message. You can also find us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn at The Loco Experience. To support the show, please subscribe and share it with your favorite people. Until next time, stay loco.